I wanted to do a very brief quote from Barry Millington because he sums up what Wagner was saying in Wagner's own work, Religion and Art. The value of religion, therefore, was to be found not in a fundamental acceptance of its tenets, but in a, in a presentation in symbolic form of its universal spiritual truths. So this is what Wagner is concerned with. And in Wagner's mind, art becomes a kind of new religion, communicating what he understands as the great spiritual truths of the world, and kind of unfettered, if you will, by the doctrines or, and dogmas of any particular tradition. And I also wanted to mention something about Parsifal that I did not get a chance to mention at the uh, other talk. And that was the significance of the swan. Because the swan is one of all of, you know, those of you who do know Parsifal will know what I'm talking about. For those of you who maybe don't, at the beginning of, uh, of Act One, Parsifal uh, enters after he has shot a white swan. And this is in the land of the grail. And all of the creatures are sacred in the land of the grail. The knights and the squires don't kill anything in, in the grail. And um, here's this beautiful white swan that has been killed, and it's lying there with an arrow in it, and it's dead. And um, Parsifal enters very much like the young Siegfried, unknowing of what he's doing and boasting of what he's done. And the wise kind of elder uh, knight, Gurnemans, uh, says to Parsifal, are you the miscreant that has done this deed? And Parsifal boasts. He says, yes, I can hit anything that flies. And he raises his, his, his bow and arrow. And then Gurnemans makes him understand what he has just done. And um, he has killed this marvelous creature. And this begins Parsifal's conversion, if you will, into a, um, a path towards enlightenment rather than kind of the young Siegfried-like running around, doing anything he wants, killing anything that gets in his way. And what's important here is that the white swan, the story comes directly from Buddhism. And uh, there's a story about uh, the Buddha when he was still a prince, Prince Siddhartha. And he was walking in the, in the forest one day and he came upon a white swan. And it was wounded with an arrow in it. And he pulled out the arrow and he nursed the swan so that it wouldn't die. And a little while later, a group of his cousins who were hunting came out of the woods and the hunter who had shot the swan said, I claim this swan because I shot it. And Prince Siddhartha said, I claim this swan because I saved its life. And Wagner knew of this story. So this is, is an example of how Wagner um, incorporates specific understandings, understandings of Buddhism into his operas. And very quickly, I wanted to do just one uh, short quote also about the white swan because Wagner also understood this and it's extraordinary to me that a person, a 19th century opera composer who had only books in a second language like you mentioned, often he had to read in French and he understood these things uh, remarkably. And in Sanskrit, uh, the word Hansa means swan and uh, the White swan is mythologically represented as the vehicle or mount of Brahma, the creator. The sacred Hansa, said to have the power of extracting only milk from a mixture of milk and water, is thus a symbol of spiritual discrimination. And here again we see the symbol of the white swan in Parsifal, which comes uh, into very great importance in Act Two of Parsifal when uh, Parsifal has his scene with Kundri. And Kundri is trying to pull him back into the old karma, if you will, um, of sexual union. She says, if I could be with you but one hour. And Parsifal knows that that can't happen. And here is Parsifal discriminating exactly what the white swan represents in Hinduism. Parsifal discriminates between what is real and what is unreal. What is the Buddha nature in Kundri asking for redemption and enlightenment? And what is the old karma calling to come back? And in the gist of the whole um, uh, act, Parsifal is able to discriminate and therefore uh, not fall to the um, temptation of Kundri and then actually come to final enlightenment. And so I know that's very brief. You can ask questions afterwards, but that's something that I wanted to mention in, uh, in a comment to what Peter had introduced. Another comment from you? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, if I could just uh, mention something from the ring, which I think is quite quite interesting. 
Uh, at the time that Wagner was working on the text of the ring, he hadn't uh, discovered uh, the, uh, his interest in Buddhism. And yet we find in Act uh, Two of, of Siegfried, uh, as Siegfried lies under the linden tree, uh, listening to the song of the forest bird, what does he say? He says, um, what are you trying to tell me? Perhaps something about my dear mother. And in an earlier draft of Siegfried, uh, Wagner has Siegfried saying, I think I hear my mother singing to me. So there's no doubt in my mind that in fact the woodbird in Siegfried is, in a sense, a reincarnation of Sieglinde, of, of Siegfried's mother. And this association between the, wood, the, between the song of the birds and a mother is very strong in Wagner. He, he even wrote to his own mother once after he'd been walking in the woods near Zurich, uh, when I hear the song of the birds, I think of you. So even before Wagner has read uh, uh, much about Buddhism, he is already attracted to the idea of reincarnation, the idea that the spirit of uh, one character can reappear in the form of another. And there's no doubt in my mind that the woodbird uh, is in fact the spirit of Sieglinde leading Siegfried to the mountaintop and to Brunhilde. I can hardly restrain my Irish levity, so I must tell this short swan story. The Metropolitan Opera is famous for its lush productions. For many, many decades, they were a great house to Wagner's music. There was a production of Lohengrin. They used a swan boat. Somebody backstage pulled the boat across the stage too soon. And, of course, the held tenor had to turn and see the boat had left him. So in perfect German, he simply asked the orchestra, when does the next swan boat leave? <laughs> so even in Wagner, there can be a moment of Irish levity. Now I turn to my friend on my right, who has something in depth to say. Yes, this section, I'm going to be talking specifically about Die Sieger. And you just heard Peter mention that Wagner had within him, even before he had read Buddhism, a sense, an almost intuition of reincarnation. And in De Zieger, as we're going to see now, Wagner actually specifically incorporates um, his idea and understanding of karma and rebirth into De Zieger. De Zieger means the victors. And the victors is used in the specific Buddhist context of those who have been victorious in their quest for enlightenment. So in other words, the Buddha is a victor. And the monks who became arahants, the fully enlightened ones, were victors. And as, as uh, you've already been told, in the world in re will and res representation, uh, Schopenhauer listed the books that he had read on Buddhism and Hinduism that had influenced him. So Wagner knew where to go. This is how Wagner understood um, how to get a hold of these books. And we need to remember that Wagner came to Buddhism only through reading books. And therefore, he did not have an actual Buddhist teacher to explain these teachings to him, and which was the same situation Schopenhauer was in. But what's remarkable to me is how much about Buddhism Wagner really did understand. He understood actually better than Schopenhauer did, even though Schopenhauer was a marvelous inter intellect. And Wagner came to accept the teachings of Buddhism in a very real, very deep way. It was not just as a theory, not as intellectual speculation, and not as a philosophy, but as a living reality. And this included the teacher, the teaching of karma and rebirth, which I'm going to explain very, very briefly. And Schopenhauer and Wagner usually used the word metempsychosis, and most people today use the term reincarnation, but Buddhism prefers to use the term rebirth. And Wagner had a very insightful grasp of karma and rebirth. And here the term karma re refers to the accumulated consequences of actions. For all actions have consequence. And all actions, all thoughts, all words have consequence. And the law of karma in this context is the law in the universe that governs the consequence of action. And this is something that Wagner understood, which again is remarkable to, remarkable to me. And the word nirvana literally translated means 
no craving or no desire. And this is how the famous Buddhist monk Narada Tara explains the way in which we continue to take rebirths until all of our own karma from past and present is completely converted and cleansed. As long as one up is, excuse me, as long as one is bound up by craving or attachment, one accumulates fresh karmic activities which must materialize in one form or another in the eternal cycle of birth and death. When all forms of craving are eradicated, reproductive karmic forces cease to operate and one attains nirvana, escaping the cycle of birth and death. And Wagner had a basic understanding of, of this teaching, which we're going to see right now. And he had actually said one time to Cosima, who was his second wife, only music can convey the mysteries of reincarnation. And by May of 1856, Wagner had read enough about Buddhism to know that the Buddha had ordained women and that the Buddha's chief attendant, Ananda, had been instrumental in, con in convincing the Buddha to ordain women, and they were called bhikkhunis. The female monks were called bhikkhunis. Um, a male monk is a bhikkhu. And Wagner never developed De Seeger beyond this sketch, at least in part because most of the spiritual ideas eventually found their way into Parsifal. And, but Wagner never completely abandoned his ideas of De Seeger, and he continued to talk about De Seeger uh, both with Cosima and his friends right up until the end of his life. And one of the books that's been mentioned already that Wagner read was Eugene Bernouf's Introduction to the History of Indian Buddhism, in which Bernouf relates a legend about the Buddha con concerning a Chandala maiden named Prakriti, who falls in love with the Buddha's attendant, Ananda. This legend became the basis for Wagner's sketch for De Seeger. And at this point, I can mention briefly that Buddhism has stories ab about the Buddha which are considered historical and stories which are understood to be legendary. And the legendary stories developed as time went on as a way of explaining certain aspects of Buddhist teaching. And the actual founding of the order of bhikkhunis took place in the fifth year of the Buddhist teaching. And the first bhikkhunis were the women from the Buddha's Shakya clan who came to the Buddha to be ordained. And the first one was Maha Pajapati Gotami, who was the Buddha's aunt, actually. And until that time, the Buddha had given teaching to lay people, both male and female, equally, but he had ordained as monks only men. And the Shakya women asked to be ordained as well. And at first the Buddha refused because he wasn't sure if the women in the context of that society at that time were up to the rigors of monastic life. But Ananda interceded on their behalf. And he asked the Buddha if women given ordination could in fact attain enlightenment just as the men could, and the Buddha said yes. And at that point Ananda asked in essence, wouldn't it be good then to give the women the chance? And the Buddha said yes. And finally, women were ordained, and the founding of the order of bhikkhunis happened. And even though Wagner understood this history, he used for dramatic purposes the Bernouf legend instead. And so what I'm going to do is summarize Wagner's sketch in my own words for you. And if you wanted to see the full verbatim translation, it is in the works of William Ashton Ellis. I believe it's in volume eight. Is that right, Peter? Volume eight. So Prakriti is a maiden born into the clan of Chandalas, who at the time of the Buddha had a very low status in Indian society. And the Buddha and his chief attendant, Ananda, visit Prakriti's city, and Prakriti falls in love with Ananda. Knowing that he is a celibate monk and therefore unavailable for marriage, Prakriti goes to the Buddha to ask him what she can do. And the Buddha tells her that in her previous life, she was the daughter of an arrogant Brahmin, and the Chandala king of that time asked the arrogant Brahmin for his daughter's hand in marriage for his son, who had fallen in love with the daughter, that is, Prakriti, in her past life. The daughter haughtily refused, cruelly mocking the sorrow of the Chandala king's son. The Buddha then tells Prakriti that because she behaved this way in her former life, she was now born Chandala herself, feeling the pangs of unrequited love so as to know the pain she had caused and mocked before. The Buddha then tells her that she can expiate her former actions and find full redemption by entering his monastic order. And because she has asked him for union with Ananda, 
And the Buddha offers her this in the context of monastic training. He tells her that she must share the monk's vow of chastity. And at first, as Wagner says, she sinks down horrified and sobbing to the ground when she realizes what it is that she has to renounce. But in the end, she does say yes to the Buddha and is admitted into the order of monks. Ananda welcomes her as a sister and the order of bhikkhunis is founded. Now we can see here that Wagner had understood a basic teaching of karma in rebirth. When the Buddha tells Prakriti of her previous life, she sees that her present birth is a direct consequence of that previous one, and she must feel the same kind of pain in her present life that she caused and mocked in her previous existence. This arrogance and cruelty led to her rebirth as a Chandala. And here Wagner has understood one of the things that links our rebirths, the creating of karma that needs converting and cleansing or in the terms that Wagner uses in the libretto of Parsifal, the need to expiate a sin committed in a previous life that has not yet been forgiven. And it is also historically true that the Buddha's monastic order was celibate. Thus, when Prakriti presses, professes her love for Ananda and requests that the Buddha unite them, the Buddha offers her admittance into the order. And this requires celibacy, and thus what is being offered is a spiritual marriage with Ananda, not a romantic one. And finally, Prakriti says yes. And redemption is found in the order of Buddha's monks and in continuing spiritual practice, not in a worldly marriage. And the idea of redemption through spiritual practice and the voluntary renunciation of physical union found its highest expression in Parsifal. And one last short thing to mention uh, before I turn this over to Peter for his comments on De Zieger. We can see in a line from the actual sketch that Wagner was aware of Buddhist history um, concerning caste. And he writes at one point in the sketch, Buddha's, uh, Buddha's attack on the spirit of caste. And part of the scenario for De Zieger is the difference in caste between the Chandalas and the Brahmins. The Brahmins, of course, were the highest caste of that time. They were the priests. And it's historically true that the Buddha preached against the idea of caste being hereditary. And in his own communities, both lay and monastic, caste was not recognized. The Buddha ordained aristocrats and servants as well as untouchables alike. And when the, in, the aristocrats, for example, would come to the Buddha to be ordained, they would sometimes bring their servants with them. And the Buddha would ordain the servant first and then the aristocrat so that in his monastic order, the former servant would be senior to the former aristocrat. And so just to sum up then, uh, Wagner's understanding of Buddhism came from reading books and not from practicing it, him, practicing it himself with a qualified teacher. And thus his understanding is certainly not perfect or complete. But for me, it's still extraordinary that a person from the 19th century had as much of an understanding of Buddhism as Wagner actually did. And he incorporated this understanding in all of his later uh, music dramas. So Peter, is there something you'd like to say about De Zieger? 